Yeah, Rob. Kim Hughes, GC, in the H Hour studio. Welcome, mate. Welcome. Absolute pleasure to have you in here. Hi, mate. Another another fast turnaround. <laughs> Sometimes it takes months to set people up. Other I set people up. That sounds a bit sinister, doesn't it? So get people in and other times it took weeks. This took weeks, but you're not far away either. No, no, just down the road, Oxfordshire. Yeah. And facilitated by David St. John Clare of the Aardvark Group. Aardvark Group, yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. Uh, which, uh, yeah, so like I said, I'm under instructions after this to take you over to the office, their office, and get a picture of you in front of... Um, get a picture of you in front in of front you. Of my, <laughs> in front of my picture. <laughs> so random, yeah. No, I've seen it in there. So, yeah, so that's a, that's what I first saw. Because I saw when I put a but going to Aardvark offices quite regularly yeah. to catch up with David and because my missus works there. And uh, and you were the first. So when someone walks into the Aardvark group's office, the first thing they see is it's not David. <laughs> it's not my missus. It's not any Aardvark kit. It's Mr. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Sergeant. Staff Sergeant. At the, well, at the time. I was a Staff Sergeant then, yeah. Staff Sergeant Kim Hughes, GC on the wall and you write up in your citation and you, yeah, and you go, know. Ali. Yeah. Ali, how does that make you feel? <laughs> I want to say special. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a bit weird, but no, no, it's cool. Yeah, he. Um, I think those guys uh, bid on that on, on, on an auction, a charity auction that we were doing. Yeah, it was a fundraiser, uh, yeah. and that was one of the things I think. That, and then David, David bought it, um, and and that all the way down the line that has led to David introducing me to you. Perfect, indeed. Perfect. Right, we were talking icebreaker. I really, there's a few in fact icebreaker and pre microphones even turning on about a few things, right? Challenge Coins being one. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? Who does that? Tom? Tom. Tom at Challenge Coins UK, yeah. Tom at Challenge Coins UK. Challenge UK. We were talking about Breck for Knives. It's, not, it's nice to drop all these things in. It's nice drop to give it a payback. It is. Yeah. Uh, Mick Taylor at Breck for Knives, previous guest. I'm sure I've spoken to Tom about being a guest on you as well. That would be awesome. Tom's maybe. I think I have. If not, it needs to happen. Because uh, I've got yeah. half his kit in this in this studio. Yeah. Like, uh, what we got? Oh, we got your... Yeah, your Challenge Coin, mate. It's different, I didn't know he could do these. Yeah, he so it's, it's not like just a standard circuit. I'm going to try and hold this to the camera. Yeah, it's the the doubloon. Can yeah. I can this go on camera? Yeah, yeah, go crazy, absolutely. Go on. Yeah, so that's the that's the doubloon he did. Oh, um, it, Tom oh. Tom, oh, get oh. Out of way. Tom does all of my uh, oh. all of my coins, and he is um, yeah, his work is just insanely good. It really is. Um, that is and cool. that's one of the most recent um, variations of that type of coin that he's done for me. Good idea, that's amazing. Go on, come into that we're mic. Good. Ah, there we go. Right. Yeah, so... Um, we'll get him in, we'll get him in. Yeah, he's, uh, yeah, he does some cracking work, really does. And then the other thing we're talking about in the icebreaker, which I am excited to hear from you talk about, actually, because it's quite on topic at the moment. So you mentioned, one of the questions is favourite film. Yeah. You mentioned a few, and then you went back, retracted it all, and said, Kajaki. Yes. Which made me very happy. It made... That film is beyond, absolutely beyond. And, and as we were saying before, um, every time someone asks me what Afghanistan was like, what it's like on the ground, what it's like with the guys, what it's like in patrol bases, I point them to Kajaki because that is probably the, the <coughs> only film which is a true representation of what it is like out on the ground there. Um, and it's just absolutely <coughs> phenomenal. And kind of the link in as well with um, Mark Wright getting um, the GC posthumously um, for his actions on that day. Um, obviously part of the BCGC association. Um, yeah, awesome film, mate. Awesome. And I didn't realise that, that you were a big part of it. Yeah, so early on... I've not see people don't really know about the background. See, there's a re, see, there's a reason I think that Kajaki is has this opinion from people like yourself of like being the best British war film that has been made, which is that's a pretty bold statement. If you think about it, it's a pretty bold statement, right? Yeah. Um, but what I think it did right, which is so many productions now get wrong, is they had fucking. It's like it's simple. It's simple, right? But somebody get it wrong. They had advisors for that film who had actually been there, done it. Or knew the subject matter like uh, uh, in depth yeah. to be able to advise properly. It wasn't some flipping idiot who would like some air softer eh? or some someone who had read a couple of books or watched all. Oh, I've seen all of the films about the powers and I thought they were an expert. Or even worse, served as some non teeth arms unit because it's a it's a teeth arms film, right? Of course, non teeth arms unit in one advice. So, like I've heard. I've heard that. Uh, you remember my girl, the series. Yeah, yeah. Right. That wasn't very good in terms of like military accuracy, right? Mm. But f 
from from because we when I when we the company that I had at the time myself my business partner at the time we would advise Uncle Jackie the company was called Selected Security and it became Fortune Nine Group but we looked at my my girl because the first series had just gone out and we're like what the fuck how have they got this so wrong like how are they getting it so badly wrong here from the way the kit is and the way she's holding the weapon just all the little things yeah the advisor was some um, ex signaler no offense to a signaler right but the the film was about an MP it was about Afghan Iraq and this this signaler. The signalers got to have been on more than the ops, but the signaler hadn't served since like seventies and eighties. So it was like nothing <coughs> knew nothing about the unit and or knew nothing about the times yeah. and the kit and the equipment. Got it completely wrong. That's what I think. Okay, Jackie got it right. So the only everyone who advised on that, like closely were involved in all of or parts of the production, were all had either all been ex power edge, were all ex power edge serving in some cases. Or they knew about the Afghan conflict in, in depth and had yep. been there, right? So, like, the, the company who advised on it was owned by myself and my good friend Luke Hardy. Mm-hmm. The, uh, oh, I should, uh, I'm my ex-wife, right? So we, we read it together. Um, I advised in the script, red penned the script. Luke went on set, advised on set. And then I think he had to, he, and then he... Someone else helped out with it, a, a, a guy called John Rowell out on set in Jordan. Uh, but even the boot camp beforehand where we trained up all the actors beforehand was Luke. My ex-wife was there. Um, we were married at the time. She was, because I was away working in the Middle East, and she, was, uh, she helped out with the boot camp. And then we had two or three reg blokes there as well. Steve Tidmarsh, uh, Tim Moffat, and, uh, and uh, Steve Tidmarsh, Tim Moffat. Steve Tidmarsh, Tim Moffat. No, I think it was, no, it was someone. Steve, there was someone else. Anyway. But my point is, everyone who was involved knew it in Italy. And it was like, a, between us, we knew every aspect of it. Because in the film, you know, there's like, you've got the mortar, you've yep. got the mortar scene, you've got all sorts of stuff going on. Anyway, I'm glad. But they, they fucked up there. Like, do, do, do you recollect the film not having any, like, MOD support? It had zero. They wouldn't support no. it. But one <laughs> of the things that got wrong <clears throat> is they, and Luke will be able to speak to this better, because he, um, uh, he he was the production team really well, and he was in, and he ended up in a relationship with one of the producers. They were married, they are married, I should say, and um, they sent the script without any. They sent the script of Kajaki, which we written, which was a great script, but had had hadn't had any military eyes on it, mm-hmm. and they sent that to the army. They sent it to three power CO. So this was basically a, a military script written by a civvy. And they sent it there and they got no support. And, and when they sent me the script after the fact, because I couldn't understand why they weren't going to get any support from the MOD and why 3 Power weren't behind it and stuff. And one of the reasons I think is because it was, it was in civilian speak. So when you read the script, it was just, it wasn't authentic. When I went and did the notes for it, there was like 7,000 7, words of notes mm. on the script just to, just to militarize it. So instead sure. of saying, oh, oh, don't be so silly. Oh, uh, uh, you, you've, been, <laughs> you've been a bloody idiot. Well, no, they wouldn't say no, that. No, 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 Fucking prick. say you fucking mong or something. <laughs> you know, like something, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and so we militarised it all like that. Um, anyway, no, I'm glad. Inter- it's interesting time to live for military stuff because Rogue Heroes. Have you watched that? You know what? I've, I'm probably about four or five episodes in. Um, and it's... I kind of like it, actually. Um, I, think, I think it's pretty cool. Knowing, knowing a little bit of the the history um, of the regiment and, and and whatnot, and it's um, yeah, I, I kind of like it, but I'm I'm everything military. I you, you when you're serving, you kind of got to sit back and go, it's entertainment, it's entertainment. It's got to be entertainment, and you know, and you talk about advising on on film and TV, and I've I've done a, a little bit here and there, um, and there's only so there's only so much a director will listen to you before they go. Thanks for that. We're going to do it this way yeah. Yeah. Um, because because it's entertainment. And funnily enough, we just just going back on one. There was um, Trigger Point was the most recent one that I'm that a friend of mine advised on. It's a Metropolitan Police bomb disposal show, and I was chatting to him a couple of weeks ago actually um, about stuff. And yeah, and it, it, it's funny to hear how as an advisor, you, well, that's not how we do business. That's not how we, we get after doing X, Y, and Z. And they're like, yeah, yeah, get that, but we're still going to do it this way. And you kind of got to, you, you're employed, you, you give your advice, that's what you're doing. And if they listen to it, they choose to listen to it. If they don't, they don't. So when it comes to military 
um, films, military series, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I always find myself going, "Fucking hell, I wouldn't do it like that." Why? And then you've got to go because you, you've done some stuff in the media and you understand how all that system works. You go, "All right, it's not that isn't for me. It's not for me to watch as a member of the armed forces or a veteran to go." Oh, yeah, no, it's not for me. It's for the wider masses. It's entertainment. So you've got to kind of bite your lip and go, you know, when someone throws a hand grenade and the whole building disappears, yeah. you know, you go, oh, you know, that's not how it, that's not, you know. But yeah. in, rea in reality, if someone threw a hand grenade and it, it, when you throw a hand grenade, you get a small bang, loads of fragmentation. But if the wider masses see that, you know, is that it? it's not entertainment. Yeah. So yeah. when stuff like Rogue Heroes and, and the other stuff, you kind of take with a, a pinch of salt. But I actually really like the show. I think it's, I think it's pretty good. Why, why do you sound like you're reluctant to say you like it? I think it's fucking No, brilliant. no, I do. I really, no, I really like it, mate. I'm, um, but again, <laughs> just, trying to, just trying to explain those bits. to, to as, as military, ex-military, you kind of sit there and go, okay, yeah. But I, no, I think it's pretty cool, mate. It is an important point to make yeah. about, um, about the, the, uh, the artistic license that the director or the, the, the you know the the crew the he, the headshed and the crew yeah. will take on to put in place like with Kajaki we were lucky because there was very little of it very little and and that's partly I have to give a shout to Luke again partly I mean I know that Luke and the director were nearly at blows a few times mm. because the director being the director wanted to change some things in the, in the true story in the true aspect because in the true parts of that whole situation wanted to change some things to dramatize it a bit but luke felt it would be at the detriment of the one of the, one or more of the characters in the film sure and they and, and he he made that very fucking clear you know hot hot day in jordan disagreeing with each other and going going batshit crazy at each other which again is not a thing that an advisor would do with a director mm. it's almost like speaking to the co the co doesn't agree he's slamming tabs and say no problem sir and you think oh, i told him but it's a bit different when you know the people it's yeah. like luke knew the people sure. who were involved yeah uh, as in the the characters um you had, yeah, you what do, was the you point have that there? What was the point of that? Oh, yeah. I mean, like the... Uh, the You were chatting about My Girl and... Yeah, the mortar scene in Kajaki. Okay, yeah, yeah. Which... That's where they were banging a Yeah, it's up. important yeah. to highlight to, I think, like military who watch stuff like this and don't really understand what goes on behind the scenes. Like, the mortar scene. Any mortarman who watching that scene, three para mortarman, uh, will be, like, pulling the fucking air out. Mm. Because it's not the way the, communi the team communicates to each other. It's not any no no more team would communicate each other like that in the UK. I don't think you're all very high standards. Mm. But it, it was like slowed down for the point of the film. It's the same with Rogue Heroes. I I mean to your point about entertainment. Oh my god. I I am not a Hereford history geek. I'm just not. Mm. I'm not. But what I like about that what Rogue Heroes has done is. It has endeared me to the history of, of Hereford. Yeah, yeah. It's like mega. I didn't know anything about David Sterling. You know, I knew he was the founder of the SEF. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know anything about him. And I take on board that his personality and his character and some of the stuff, or a lot of the stuff in Rogue Heroes, is probably not quite what happened. Some of it is, some of it isn't. Right? Awesome. However, I think he's an alley bastard even yeah. more than I did before. Because yeah. <laughs> of Rogue Heroes. Same with Paddy Main. You know what yeah. I mean? It's just cool. It's just done really well. <laughs> What did you think about mixing in the modern the modern music? Into you know what? I like that. I thought that was pretty cool. You know, and you know, I can't. It was ACDC or something. ACDC. Something. Yeah, I was like, oh, I was like Highway when to I, Hell. Yeah, when I first I first watched it, and going, is that AC, oh, Thunderstruck? Is that, is Thunderstruck. That, I was like, yeah. what the hell is that? And I thought, but I, I, you know what? I love the way I love the way the director or whoever's done it. it I think it works really, really well because <laughs> it is not just that. You know, is it a historic series? Um, it's got the banter in there. It's got the humour in there. Um, and with the modern music, I think it just, I think it really does make it. It's pretty cool. So that was the advising company. Ah, see. Uh, Bear yeah. Arms. Yeah. Bags, Bags Simmons. He's been on the podcast before. Be on, I'm going to interview him again soon about the, about what? the, uh, about Rogue Heroes. Because, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I don't, I don't think I've met anyone who, hasn't enjoyed it. No, I think it's pretty but cool. I'm sure if you go online onto Facebook, you'll find the morons. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you will probably be an ass off there. Yeah, either talking about <laughs> that that wasn't made and now those weapons, or yeah. uh, oh, I don't know, or like grenades don't leave so um, grenades don't go like that. Yeah, that, that's not how Paddy Main was. No, but it is good. It's going to be a second series, I think, isn't it? Is there? I'm not even. I'm not even. Um, I think at so. The, end of the first one. I need to. I need to play. I've been away, so I need to play. Catch I up would. A bit. I would hazard a guess that if we went to see how the how series one went, 
if they do a series two or not. That would be my guess. I think they will. They've, I think they will. It's done really well. Um, and the way it's left at the last scene with Paddy, spoiler. Oh, you haven't seen it? No, yet, I've not seen it, mate. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm a few okay, behind. Okay. But um, see, I got, I missed the first, the middle few. Oh, okay. I watched one, two, three, and four. Then I came in, came back. My missus was into it as well. I came home uh, to hers, and she was. She stuck on an episode while I was working, and I thought it was the next episode. It was the last fucking episode. So I've gone straight from like episode four to the last episode. Ah, uh, okay. Missed all you missed between. it in bits. Yeah, but yeah, that was good. Yeah, Rogue Heroes, good. You need you need decent British military production. You do because the Yanks have got. They literally have got it monopolized. Yeah. They've got the money, they've got the kit, they've got the equipment, they've got the space, they've got the laws where you can do and shoot that kind of stuff in, in America, you know, like the weapons and all that kind yeah, of, of stuff. Yeah, of course. You know, all those little things that make up to make amazing productions, like money being the main one. Yeah. But we can do it well when we fucking do it. Kajaki, Rogue Heroes, there's been a few others. Um, yeah. You yeah. ever done any TV and film stuff? Funny, I'm... Um, at the moment, I'm kind of doing some stuff right now, looking at um, uh, a TV series coming out. But um, it's again, it's that whole, it's that moving between different kind of different things from from writing. Um, so my autobiography, and then I moved into fiction, and then trying to do that transition into into TV uh, and to, into film. And it's very different. It's very um, the way they do the business is very different. Um, so we're kind of kind of working with a production company at the moment. Um, to uh, that's probably all I'm going to say. But to 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 do come up with some TV stuff coming out very shortly, hopefully. Um, but again, the the the, the industry is kind of up and down. And and everyone everyone I think for the next ten years people are going to blame COVID. I think that's going to be on for the next ten. What industry is up COVID. and down? Um, as in. Um, media like from um from publication um books through to through tv stuff so people are trying to catch up at the moment from that two-year period when nothing really went on um so it's just trying to trying to get that ball rolling again um fortunately enough we're um we're, we're there um with with various various things but um yeah it's just it's it that that two-year sort of lull is is kind of kind of pissed on everyone's chips um, so now, as I said, we're just trying to play patch up again with, with the fiction series. So hopefully, we're trying to get book three um, going, um, which is which is good. But um, it's just sluggish. Well, the TV and film industry didn't really stop you in the UK, because I I was working on Slow Horses as an extra yeah. for about a year during the during during COVID, the pandemic during yeah, pandemic, yeah. mate, and uh, and only because they were so fucking rigid with their COVID. Uh, the COVID uh, protocols. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh my God, mate. Uh, do, do you remember? Do you remember when that that clip went viral of Tom Cruise going ballistic? Yeah, went, someone. Yeah, because someone took the mask they, off or something. Yeah, yeah, right. Now, I think probably like everyone else, I thought at the time, oh, what a bellend. Calm the fuck down. Mm. But having then been on set and worked on a production for a, a length of time, and seeing like the why, I can see why he did that. Because if they do the slightest, like the only reason they're allowed to keep going is because their protocols are so tight. Like, and they were rigid with it, man. I expected to step on the set. And, uh, you know, because sets, you know, production sets are fucking massive. But yeah, yeah. Depend, like Slow Horses was, wherever we were, if we were filming in the street in London or if we were in a studio somewhere, they were huge. Shit loads of people. And I expected, oh, if you go into the back room, like the restroom and have a coffee break or the fucking green room or wherever and to chill out, then you'd walk in and people have their masks off, even though the rules to have your mask on inside. I thought people would be flaunting the rules and they weren't. No. They were rigid with it. And that's why, because they recognised this is our livelihood. Yeah, we've got to follow the rules to the letter of the law. It was, it was incredible. And even now they're doing it. So I, <clears throat> I got asked to go back. I say I got asked. I, yeah, it's extra work, right? It's not like an actor. I got asked to go back on to, to film for... I think it's series three for Slow Horses. Do some, just a couple of different scenes, and um, and even now, they've still got the COVID protocols in place. Mm. So if I got to go and get, well, I have to go and get a fit in, and the day before the fit in, I have to get a COVID test. The, it's a rapid COVID test. You get the you get the results within twenty four hours. The results come back positive. You message them, go yeah, they're positive, and they say yeah, come in for the fit in next day. Then if you need a haircut before the shoot, you have to have a 
the day before the shoot, you have to have another COVID test before that. So you literally, COVID test one, day one, fit in day two, another COVID test day two, for your haircut on day three, a COVID test on day three again, for your shooting on day four. And they're still doing it now. But it's like, ad I say it's admirable. They're, they're the rules they've got to abide by and, and they've got to do it rigidly and they, they, they are doing mm. that, which many industries were. And you can argue, do you need to be wearing masks? Do you need all the COVID tests? This, uh, you can argue that actually blue in the face, but the fact of the matter is that's what they had to do during the pandemic to keep going to bring the entertainment to us. I mean, it's a Netflix, uh, no, it's a, uh, Apple, Apple TV yeah, yeah. series. If I mean, lockdown probably would be more miserable if there wasn't new stuff coming about. You know what I mean? It would have been reruns. TV would just be reruns. Well, I mean, there lo loads of films, loads of films were delayed for it. Um, so we had we had that massive lull where there was fuck all coming out in the cinema. Well, couldn't go to the cinema anyway. Oh yeah. Um, you know, um, and it just, so it almost was a lot, not necessarily reruns, but it was a lot of shit TV during COVID because mm. stuff, if, if stuff was being made, it was being made, but not, not put out there. Um, and I had a number of conversations about it with, with various people in, in that industry. And yeah, you, you're right in what you say with regards to the testing and how they, they got about it. And you, funny, you should say about the, the Tom Cruise get or the Tom Cruise, um, sort of bit. And, um, I was—I can't remember. I was just randomly chatting to a guy that did a film with Tom, and he was saying he's, he's quite rigid when he comes to um, his profession and his art and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting that you said that, and, and yeah, I couldn't agree more. They are, or they have, they have been down the line with the COVID, and they don't go to the left or to the right of arc of it. They are. They, they stay because as you said it's, the, it's, their, it's their livelihoods and their business and they don't want to be caught out by it mm. mm -hmm. uh, unlike others that were having parties and enjoying themselves during COVID oh <laughs> mention no names <laughs> Boris <laughs> I kind of wanted to go to that party but, um, yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine it was very good no. it would have been drinks in the office wouldn't uh, it it was in the office wasn't it uh, yeah and in the sort of like back garden-y bit at the back of number 10 yeah yeah fuck's yeah. sake fun times what about um, what about uh, I'm a celeb, get me out of here. Okay, yeah, with um, Ma Matt, Matt Hancock, Matt Hancock. Who, went, who, who came third, yeah. who came, got voted out, but this is the point I'm making. You remind, you're, it reminded me, so when I'd forgotten about this episode, because I've I got a memory of a goldfish, he came out of the jungle. Did you watch any of it? You know what? I'm I watched not, Arthur, a, a, bit, a bit of it. I watched, I watched a bit of the, the final. Um, you see when he came out? Yeah, he, I saw it. Yeah, he came out, but at that stage, there I can't. So he know. comes out, and when they come out, they meet the family. They meet the family and hug the wife. And all yeah, that sort and it, of well, stuff. It was his missus Kim and hugged him. I saw that, and then and I think that I stopped is watching. the chick who he had the affair with. No. Yes, I'd forgotten all about. Remember, remember when he got caught on CCTV? Yeah, he got caught having a double with. Affair. Yeah, well, that's her. Is it? Yeah, that was her. She came out. I was like, oh my god, I've forgotten all about that. It's a legend. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my God, my God. Uh, no, I didn't. Um, I think I stopped watching it at that point there. Um, yeah, after you've seen people eating deer, What a crazy deer, time deer, for politics. Deer. What a crazy time for politics we're in at the moment. Me everything's mental. Mate. Everything. Society's mental. Politics is mental. Technology's mental. Fucking I mean, war is mental. To, to I mean, I'm and For three years now, crazy. <laughs> it was crazy before the pandemic. And now that's just made it bonkers man to be on to be honest mate it's embarrassing um i'm 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 not i'm not going to sit here and harp on about politics and politicians and all that sort of good jazz but i was <laughs> I, I i was away and i'm like i'm like fucking i was away and then i just i, I catch up on sky news and stuff and um tr um liz truss is out I said, what the fuck are you on about she just got in no she's out like 42 44 whatever how many i was like I was with, you know, there's loads of American people. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, we've had four years of Trump every day, without a doubt, on the telly. Trump. And I've just, I've just got back from America and I've had these conversations, Trump, Biden, Biden, Trump, and all that sort of good jazz. And what's going on? I mean, it's just as bad over there. And listening to all my, all my mates over there that talk about Trump's, you know, he's this and he's, he's yeah, he's a fucking space cadet and all this sort of stuff. But... He's done a lot for the country. And then, like, fucking every day that he was on telly in the UK, every day, sat on the toilet at three in the morning tweeting and all that good stuff that he did, you know. Um, but then Liz Truss just bails. I'm like, ah, seriously, come on. 
I mean, it's just fucking embarrassing. And that's all I'm going to say about politics. That is a very <laughs> simple way of putting it. Liz Chess Bell, yeah. No, that's true. Oh, well, I mean, I, America's got it worse. America's got it worse than us. Like, we've got the political drama, okay? They've got the political problems, uh, the corruption problems within the politics, right. but they've also got the societal problems. Like, the, the polarization... I've banged on before, maybe on air or off air, about po- polarization. People... Are, are the, the polarization over here of tr- the attempt at polarization of society. We've got it in politics, right? Blue and red, right and left. W- but we don't have it in, like they have it in terms of race or, well, mainly race. The polarization of race over there is just for, I don't think people understand it. They are teetering on the brink of catastrophe. Mate. I really think so. Catastrophe. And they've got society who aren't happy for whatever for whatever reasons. I think that they have, I think they've got, They've got less need to be unhappy than they think, but that's not what they've been painted, right? And that's for whatever reasons. And you've got a completely disjointed government who aren't, who just aren't able to lead themselves or lead arguably the world, let alone their own country. And so when you, so when I think about the UK here, all we've got is fucked government. Mm-hmm. Like, as a society, as a people, I think generally we are okay. Like everyone, oh, no, yeah, yeah, you, we know, are. you know what I mean? We've got the right and the left, we've got the blue and the red, but we, gen- we, we generally are right. You know what I mean? You you haven't you haven't got the crazy violence and hate of each other that you have out there in certain Mate, places. You know what? I was, I was I've just got back and it's refreshing to come back to you. Don't be wrong. I had an amazing time out there and I saw my mates shot loads of guns and and generally had a really good time. But you're absolutely right. They're they're just, they're just fucking angry all the time, and it's all about what my rights are. And I can do this, and you can't take my guns away, and you, and and it's just, it's that whole balance. It's it's gone. It's it's gone so far. There's no coming back from what it. What do you think about the gun laws? <laughs> so, um, so I am. So I'm. Watch I'm, those. Watch those eggshells there. Yeah, watch no, those no, <laughs> Yeah, all, all, all my mates will be like, ah, what, what? No. So I'm. So I'm a. I'm a gun enthusiast. I've got firearms um i'm a firearms instructor uh both here and in the u.s um and i I train all the time and i've just you know i I did a lot of shooting when i was across there but the system is broken you know and it's it's visiting various friends houses over there and they've got more guns than you can shake a shitty stick at and it's and i went to one of the gun shows out there and it's insane you know, there's, there's, I think, I, I don't even know the numbers, like 10 guns per person in America or something insanely ridiculous like that. Yeah, three, yeah, three times the amount of guns yeah, in America yeah. than there are people, right? It's, something like it's that. It's insane. Like, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely insane. And you can see that, you know, a friend I stayed with, a couple of friends I stayed with, in excess of 50 to 100 guns. Because it's the whole, oh, it's Second Amendment. Mm, okay. So but my. What's the problem with owning a quantity of guns? No, there's, right, there's. It, the gun control laws, okay, there are different different states, different counties, different rules. But essentially, when you're punting the, the Second Amendment, which, you know what, fine, it's how you interpret that, you know, the right to bear arms. Okay, so my question to a lot of the guys over there, do you need a fully automatic AK-47 for home defense? Oh, yeah, bullshit. No, you fucking don't. If you, if you, if you turn around and say, my Second Amendment allows me to have a firearm then fine, go and have a firearm, but don't justify it by its home defense. I need a Barrett 50 cal for home defense. Get fucked. No, you don't. Because you're not thinking about where that bullet's going. You think, I'm just going to, Second Amendment says I can have it. That's fine. Then own that and say, Second Amendment says I can have it, so I can have it. Have it. But don't give it, oh, it's for home defense. It's for this, that's the other. And it's the system, you know, uh, when Barack Obama was in, he tried to, you know, um, and I, I was in America at the time where they tried to bring in new gun laws, whether the restriction capacity of magazines or um, uh, I don't know, correct me on it, if, if the government was going to put a contract in place with the ammunition manufacturers to say, we want you to make all of the defense ammunition. So therefore taking the civilian um, ammunition away or, or reducing it because we want you to commit to this or whatever it was. Panic buying sets in. You know, and I've seen it. I went over to, I used to be a big fan of Bass Pro Shops, which are massive, massive gun shop, hunting. You know, you go in there, there wouldn't be anything on the shelves because panic buying sets in. You know, we're looking at changing gun laws, panic buying. And I'm, you know, I've been to, I've been to guys' houses where they've, 
essentially got <laughs> they've got more ammo and more guns than you would have in a regiment. It's but insane. Yeah, I mean, on the subject of like the polarization we talked about just now, so I think one of the problems they go over there is is that the way so the, they only the media and and the NRA. Those two and other big influential organisations yeah. and and things, information distributors, they 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 are trying to the ones the organisation either on one side or the other, mm. either yeah we can have any guns we want or or they think no you shouldn't have any guns right, um, they paint it like the, the, those are the only two options you either can have so when so when someone who is Oh, we're going to increase the gun control laws. Or well, even that conversation comes up. The gun owner, the pro, you know, the pro, uh, yeah, the pro Second Amendment yeah, yeah. Uh, person. What they hear, because the condition to it is, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to have any guns, yeah. and they'll make me give my guns back, yeah. which isn't the case. There's like, there's a solution. There is a solution to what they have, and it pl- and it pleases everyone. So, and I, because when they say, you know, gun control, what I think is, oh, well, that's let's do what the UK did, like in the UK. We in- introduced gun control, and you know more about this than me, right? Because you, you are firearms instructor, you got a firearms license. I haven't got that. Last time I shot was when I was serving. And, but what we have is middle ground. You've got gun control. You can own a fucking we- uh, uh, a weapon if you <coughs> want. You can own a weapon if you want. If you uh, can be proven to be capable of, own- of, of having one safely. So from storing it securely... To having the the mental capacity not being basically being at least risk of being a lunatic, mm. that's it. So you can go and own a weapon if you want. You can do that in America. So it's like have the gun control laws increase the checks that happen before you can buy a weapon. If you are sound in the mind, you can buy a weapon. Why would anyone be against that? And 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 over here, so on the weapons. On the you know, on the subject of fully automatics, we well, can't have fully automatic. You can't own a short barrel weapon over here. There's certain calibers you can't have, but you can absolutely over here in the UK if you really want to, and you're sound in mind, and you can demonstrate a reason. You can buy a weapon that is lethal and have it in your home. There's nothing stopping you doing it if you meet the criteria. Sure, that's it. And, it, and the criteria literally only exists to make sure you're sound in mind and you can store it securely. So there's no risk of it getting nicked, and there's minimal risk of you murdering someone. Like a fucking nutter. Yeah, and why think, can't you do that in America? They don't want to discuss that middle ground. Though. Yeah, they, the NRA will paint it as gun control laws means you're going to lose everything and you never get more weapons. But the problem is, mate, is look at the look at the money that is made. Oh yeah, in the weapon manufacturing, weapon sales over it's there. It's insane, mate. It's fucking crazy. Yeah, it's insane. It you know, it's it's one of it, it's it, it's just and again without without going over there and seeing it and and looking at the enormity of it uh, yeah i'm sorry i'm just conscious to point out i may be talking shit because i've never i you know, i don't know it inside and out i'm not an american no I'm no not no, there, no, no, no not no no that's cool but but you're right but the the drama is the system's broken you know you've got essentially if they if they were to try and bring in the gun laws now or not gun laws restrictions or, or further checks because that's all it's ever going to be everything up until that point <coughs> gets grandfather rights so the the billion guns, however many guns are out there, it's just got, and the movement. There's no control over the movement of those guns. So my pal John could literally turn around to his mate and say, "Here, have this have this AK-47 as a birthday present." Yeah, but it's less likely with increased gun control, right? So this is one of the arguments they have. Oh, you could make you could make all automatic weapons, for example, illegal, and you can't buy them, right? Oh, well, if criminals want them, they'll still be able to get them. That's fucking true, but it'll be harder because when you bring those, when you bring, when you let's say they out, they make all them automatic weapons, or let's say they make thirty round magazines illegal. All automatic weapons are legal, right? Yes, they're all in circulation. Let's say there's grandfather rights, and all the ones that exist now and people have got them, they get to keep them. Maybe they have to register them, but they get to keep them, right? For example, but what it means is the stakes of owning of owning one of those illegally after the law comes in if you want to get one it makes it it makes the stakes higher there is more risk if you go to jail jail time for because there's more things are illegal it also means that they become harder to get those weapons are harder to get which puts the price up mm-hmm. which means it's more expensive which means when something's more expensive then it means less criminals can buy it because you're cutting out low low level criminals who are arguably right the more mentally uh, compromised, right, at the lower end of the scale. 
They're less likely to be able to get the weapons. It makes it it does mean you can ship them around still, but it makes it much harder to get hold of. I think you kind of got to be careful with the terminology criminals because it's not necessarily the criminals that are going to be wanting the guns. Because you, I mean, it's. I think it's safe. It's safe to say if you want a gun in America, you can get one. Anyone can get one unless you're a foreign national. But even even then, fucking hell, Um, it's it's that it's the the topic is so not necessarily sensitive. No, it is fucking sensitive. Sensitive, it's sensitive yeah. as fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely insane. I wouldn't want to go there and engage in conversation. Oh, with I love it. I, I love it because I love it. I love planting the seed and then standing back. I think it's <laughs> fucking brilliant, mate. Pulling the pin, chopping that grenade. Say, so what do you th- what do you think about the restrictions <laughs> in the Second Amendment? And I'm just step back and go, fuck, boom. and you like that. And then all my mates are like, you're a dick. You're a fucking dick. <laughs> you're not coming again. But no, you know what? Um, it is. It's the topic is massive. Um, the system is broken. That every time someone comes in, you know, for, and I'm not going down the fucking rabbit hole of mass shootings and all that sort of jazz because it's just, it would be here for hours. Um, you know, I, I think they've got the guns. They're, they're, every time they try and bring in restrictions, mass, well, mass buying and all that sort of jazz. Uh, let's, let's give an example of a, uh, so mass shooting, right? Just an example here of a mass shooting. So um, I think there was one, re- well, you, get, you get them done by school kids, right? Yeah. Outlaw automatic weapons, okay? Um, because they've gone in there with fucking AKs and all sorts of weapons and done it, right? So in those examples, a school kid isn't going to be able to afford an, an illegal automatic weapon all of a sudden has quadrupled in price because you can't just get them in a local Walmart because they're illegal and so the stakes are higher. So a school kid isn't going to be able to afford one. So it cuts all that segment out. That was the point I was making on that. It's not, it's not as simple as weapons will still be available whether they're illegal or not. Yeah, they are, but are, like less available. I don't want to come back onto that point. But no. Yeah, it's... Okay. No, yeah. Right. It's, what it's, it's one of the, now? It's fucking, fucking <laughs> hell. So all the American guys out there, yeah, Second Amendment, awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fucking God hell. Sick. Yeah, I mean, that, to be honest, mate, that topic is just... I mean, you could sit... I sit, I sit and talk for hours, you know, when I'm across there, and I did last week, um, chatting about our gun laws and, and saying... And, you know, as you said there, we have checks and balances in place and they should be there and UK gun laws although some people think they're restrictive they're there for a reason um, and yeah you've got to jump through some hoops with certainly now with the medical checks and all that sort of stuff which um, you know at, at 60 quid a signature is fucking extortionate but it's there for a reason you know um, and and I'm all for it I'm all for it absolutely all for it I'm a bit gutted that we don't have pistols anymore because I'm I'm you know I love shooting pistol um, competition or, or whatever when I'm when I'm out of the country, but there's reasons and if you, you know if you want a firearm you got to jump through the hoops for it mm. you got to do all those you know you got to tick all the right boxes and if if you don't you don't and if you do brilliant um, but safety is key. Yeah. 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 That's all we got to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's fucking move on. Fucking <laughs> hell. <laughs> Mate, explain to me the totem. Your totem. Okay, so... I, you were <clears> talking <throat> about this on the phone, and I've just been looking at the card you gave me with this challenge coin. Yeah. Well, like, it's not a challenge coin. It's a totem made by Challenge Coins UK, which I showed the camera earlier. Explain this to me, because I've got the card I can read about it, but I'm not going to read it. Sure, on, so on. so I've, I've got a variation. I have the, uh, have the silver va- ra- variation. How come you've got a better one? It's just the Son same. Of a it's just bitch. Why is mine smaller? Well, no, it's the same. same. <laughs> it's smaller, a different colour. So you've got the antique variant, and I've got the silver one. But you know, I'll send you an antique one with the rest. I'm of my joking. Stuff. I'm joking. It's fine. No, you can fucking have one. <laughs> <laughs> I can fucking send it. I don't want to see it on the next podcast. Um, so uh, chuck me mine, and I'll talk you through your one, or your one and mine. Mine was slightly warm because it's been in my pocket. Um, so um, this stemmed from. Uh, so let's go back a little bit. So the Wayfinder I'm, Totem. The Wayfinder, the Wayfinder Totem. This is the Wayfinder Totem de Bloom. The Wayfinder Totem original is a, I think it was a 12-sided coin, I think it is. Um, made for me by Tom at Challenge Coins UK. Um, massive thanks, Tom. And essentially, so I spend all of my downtime in Iceland. Um, Iceland is my sort of zen go-to place. I love it. I spent a lot of time... Excuse me. I spent a lot of time over there when I was serving because I uh, assisted in running a, a, a NATO bomb disposal exercise out there, which is completely random, but um, they do it. And um, it's kind of my go-to chill-out place. I love it. Um, I love the, you know, just going into the middle of nowhere off the beaten track and all that sort of stuff. And I kind of wanted something with me which kind of would ground you. 
you know, and I do a lot of work with um, various military charities, um, PTSD work and, and, and all that sort of jazz. And I've chatted to a lot of the guys about their struggles and, and, and all that. Um, and I kind of wanted something uh, that someone could have with them. So so essentially, the, the Wayfinder Totem on one side, I don't know if you can see the picture there. Or yeah, I'll show, it there. I'll show it So on one side, you have a... Oh, describe, describe it anyway, because most people listen. They don't Roger, want. okay. Which so, side am I looking at? Uh, the compass side. Okay, so wow, so so now. so essentially that is that is a broken moral compass. So you'll see there it doesn't point true north, um, and that essentially is to remind people that no one's perfect. Um, and then if you flip it over to the other side, you have the Icelandic Wayfinder oh, yeah, sign. Oh, yeah, true north. Yeah, the north yeah, is off. Yeah. yeah, it's slightly off. So it's a broken broken moral compass. Oh, that's subtle. I like that. Yeah. And then on the other side, you have the Icelandic Wayfinder. <laughs> now that was a. Um, mythological symbol which helped people find their way during stormy weather um the um the nordic translate or the translation of that um the nordic is uh, as others withdraw always push on um and that's kind of my kind of mantra i kind of really like that and i i, I push that to a lot of people and then the coin itself is called a totem so for those of you who may or may not have seen the film um inception with leonardo dicaprio Essentially, it's about invading people's dreams um, and either to plant suggestion or to get information. But the uh, the guys that um, the guys that do that have something called a totem with them, and essentially that um, that means that they're in the real world when they have that, so they know they're not in a dream state. So I kind of like that. Um, I kind of like that. So to have the actual coin itself um, with the broken moral compass to to essentially you know, tell you that not everyone's perfect. The Icelandic Wayfinder on the back there to help people find their way. The um, inscription as others withdraw, always push on. And then the totem reminding you just to keep shit real. Um, all of that came together in a coin. And randomly, I was, in, I was doing this kind of random hike. It, it, it can only be described as some sort of Indiana Jones kind of thing. I was doing in Iceland. I went up this ravine into this cave, up this waterfall, you know, could have died. Um, and it kind of was there, and it's the, it's kind of there where it was born. That's kind of what I wanted. So I, I, I sat down with Tom at Challenge Coins, and uh, we came up with this design. Um, and I started pushing it out to the guys and girls with the card that I've given you there. And you know what? It, it's gone absolutely mental. Um, for, for people that struggle, um, you know, mentally, physically, um, something to have with them, and and it's it's come on leaps and bounds, and we've we've pushed out you know thousands of them um, to to all sorts, and and some I started doing you know when they'd go out we would donate um, a, a percentage to to various charities, and each charity would change each month. Um, but then we uh, decided to do a um, gift a coin or donate a coin, so. If you were to get one, you could then donate one. And then what that would mean is I would then send that out. I'd go to a number of charities and say, um, have we got some names of people that are struggling? What and then mean, we would send if them you out. were to get one, you would then donate one? What do you mean? So, oh, well, I've got one. Yeah, so um, if, you were to, if you were to come to me and get one, um, you could also select on the sort of Shopify page, donate a coin. Yeah. So then, oh. then, then that coin would be donated so on you your buy it behalf. Like a gift. Yeah, but that would be donated um, anon anonymously on your behalf. Got it. Got yeah. it. Got and that it. that went absolutely crazy. I like that. And then we did. Uh, we banged out a load to Ukraine um, to the guys and girls over there. Um, yeah, and it's just gone absolutely mental. Uh, and it, they're they're really, yeah, they're really cool. They're really cool. And uh, as I said, this is the new one. This is the Wayfinder Totem de Bloom. And this one has just gone crazy. I think people like it because it looks like it's just been stamped out of raw metal. And it's just, it's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, so, um, so yeah, that's it basically. And um, yeah, they've gone, they've gone absolutely. Uh, so how can people get all of these? So um, yeah, so my, I, t I, I don't have, a, I have a Shopify page. It's Threat Reduction Limited. That's my company. Um, I'm on Instagram. Um, but yeah, if you go on Shopify Threat Reduction, you can get them on there. Um, and yeah, and as, we, as I said, we just we send them out. We send you know hundreds of these go out. I'll, I'll buy a couple off you, and I'll give, do a giveaway to my patrons. Yeah, they're, they're cool. If that's mate. all right. No, they'll go crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'll do but it. I'll send you a silver one because we know you like the silver one. So, <laughs> to, be, like to, to be honest, mate, to, no. To be honest, mate, I really like that one first. It's the antique one. But when Tom did the silver ones, I went, you know, oh, this is pretty cool. I really like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, that's where you can get them from. Yeah. Cool. Yep. I'll definitely have a couple of you. Awesome. Um, thank you. Uh, 
What was I going to say to you then? Oh, you mentioned Instagram. My missus was mentioning something to me about some video you put on. Ah, oh, she said, because we, we, <laughs> we were talking about you last night at the dinner table. And, uh, at least it wasn't in bed. And she, there's like a spider there, like. And she, uh, she said, yeah, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't post on Instagram very much himself, but he did this video. Because I said, oh, Sh- show me what he looks like. So he rocks up. <laughs> <laughs> <Same fuck. laughs> Who's that dude? Yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, video about some airsoft. No, fucking hell. Oh, come on. on that, Spin this dip. Right. I, Spin mate, this dip. Fuck. So, so it all stemmed. Stems. It still happens. I get daily hits from from airsofters. Now, don't be wrong, right? And I did a video saying, you know, I. I've not got an issue with airsoft. There's a lot of my really good mates do airsoft and they absolutely love it and they're all over it. But you get some fucking waltz out there, mate. And yeah, you have to do a disclaimer there. Yeah, nothing against professional, like, not professional, against airsofters doing no. the airsoft the airsoft. No, no. They, no I, you know what? I've got, I've got mates that do it. They love it. They absolutely, they're all over it. But then there are airsofters that do it because they want to think they're military. Oh, yeah. As in... Yeah. Yeah, they want to they want to give people the impression they're military. Well, you reckon? I don't know if it's the impression that, but they, they essentially cut. I mean, I'm all for people. If people want to go and dress up on the weekend and run around the woods, then go crazy. Um, but when I so I'll I'll do some firearm stuff, uh, whether it's here or overseas or whatever, um, or I'll I'll be doing stuff on bomb disposal or, you know, I had a guy I had a guy read my autobiography and he came back to me going, you know, he's pissed that go over it <laughs> and I was like fucking hell mate alright and I was like you know what Everyone's how many t- bombs did uh, you did, uh, uh, make safe uh, how many IEDs I mean I've done I've done, a, I've done a few um, hundreds yeah I've done, I've done a lot I've done <laughs> piece a, of piss mate piece of piss <laughs> yeah um, so so yeah this, it initially started I had this guy reach out saying I read your book and I thought that was really nice um, and he went yeah pr- pretty sure I'll be all over that just as I and then he went into just as I took up tactics piece of piss and I was like oh fucking hell here we go this guy ex-military no, no. Um, did you know at the time full, full blown softer mate full blown softer and, and it was just I'm, I'm into tactics I'm into this and I'm into that and you should do and I'm like mate come on now and you, you do get them um, and they'll reach out saying you know you know, you, you, anything, anything military, it's, it's, it would be like me telling you how to jump out of an aeroplane and I've never done it before in my life and saying, are you pulling your fucking strings wrong? Or I, I don't know, I've never jumped out of an aeroplane on my own. Pulling your strings uh, wrong. <laughs> you, you're wait, pulling wait, your strings string wrong. wrong. I've wait, been doing like, it wrong well, my entire <laughs> life. I, uh, I wasn't pulling your strings, 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 strings wrong, mate. wrong. Yeah, or, or whatever <laughs> it is. And I'm like, fucking hell, mate. And then you go, I, I, this one guy, when I just thought, I'll have a look. I, I know he's an ass. I went on and I, Mate, he's cutting around in a pair of cry precision pants. Um, Ali. Ali as fuck. You know, nothing wrong with cry precision. It's an awesome kit. But, and, it, and it, I, I, I think, I don't know if it's that video, in a beer garden with a big can of super and a big, and like, got hanging out. And Hang like, on, he's in a pub beer garden with his cry, cry yeah, yeah. trousers on. Because it's cool. Um, Did he have the knee pads in? Yeah, full blown. Oh, amazing. Full, fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think they were new as well, so they'd never, never been fucking... What was he drinking? Never been fucking... What was you fucking I, I, Carlin? Can of Carlsberg. Fucking, can, of, can of super or something. Yeah. Fucking, was he vaping? It was just, I don't know, mate. But, he just, <laughs> but I was like, fucking you mess, mate. I was like, come on now. <laughs> and you just get... And, you know, and it's various and had another one giving it. I'm a, I'm a an airsoft umpire and I deserve the same respect as special forces because I teach tactics. No. And I was like, mate. No. no. Je- mate, Jen. You're serious. Jen, mate. And it's just like, all right, fuck, did you really just say that out loud? And I'm like, I'm all for people. I'm this fun. is on a video? No, no. This this was p- uh, d- DM to me. Oh, was like, d- DM into me. And I'm like, oh, Fucking hell, mate. All right, and, oh I, and but I've I've met I've met guys like that as well. You know, you go to the shooting shows and all that sort of stuff, and you know I'll go and meet people, um, or I'll do talks or or whatever it may be, and then they, I'm all for it. I'm all for people going out and having fun and what they're passionate about. But when you've got some dude who clearly is allergic to the gym, standing in front of you giving it tactics, my primary, my secondary. <coughs> this, that, and the other, and I'm like, and he stood there in, you know, like cry precision, thrown up all over him, and you're like, mate. I wonder. I am. I know a few ex-military who do airsoft. I think I know a few ex-military who do airsoft, and I can see why. Like, I can see the appeal of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can a, see the appeal a, of it. It's a laugh. It's if gonna d- be the next closest thing to going down D range in fucking Brecon, like that. A civil, like 
it's not the next closest thing to battle, right? Well, maybe it is for civvies, but but I can see the appeal. But I wonder, right? If there's, if I do wonder, if they would be better off if you pick them up, pick the airsoft up, and drop them into a an actual situation in a another country, actual contact, actual battle somewhere, right? Whether they would fare better than the av- average civilian, and I think they would, you know. Well, you know, I think they would. They must do. They, I mean, to a to a so certain extent. What does that say about it? <clears throat> I mean, they obviously they're watching all the right videos. Kind, what, what kind if, of. What if? What if? Russia invades. I'm fucking out, mate. Russia invades, and this the force that saves Britain kicks the Russians out is an amalgamation of ex-military and. Operational air softers. I'm I, telling you, mate. Mate, I, ha- I have. And we borrow weapons from America because they've got them all. Well, just have them. <laughs> I, 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 ha- I think I did a video. I did a video not long ago about air a guy. soft reserves. You could do it, mate. I, I had a guy. There's something there. I had a guy stating to, saying to me, you know, I'm thinking about going out to Ukraine. This air soft guy. Oh no. Um, <laughs> and I was like, mate, fucking don't. I was like, please don't. <laughs> You know, I'm I'm all for it. I mean, support it, but donate money or 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 your kit. Donate your kit because you've clearly got too much money. Yeah. Because you're buying all the Gucci stuff. Um, and then there was another one that gave it. You know, when. Oh God, I can't remember what it's something like when when our our troops are away and the enemy is here or the enemy's at our front door. Who do you think's gonna? Who do you think they're gonna send to protect people like you? And I went, you fucking what? And I was, I was like, they, and that's what it was. It was, it was they, like the, and I went, the government. The government are going to send airsofters to protect well, civilians in the UK because all of our armed forces are away. Well, let's do a little thought experiment Fucking here. Fucking legend, though. mate. Kim, let's do a little thought experiment here, right? The Russians are coming, right? You and I, we are running the MOD, right? You are the Minister for Defence or whatever, Fucking whatever you call him. And I'm that home secretary, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Whoever's involved, right? I don't know. We can have some other mates in there, whatever other positions to make them up. So it's mates rates. I mean, you're in politics, c- it's mates rates. Co- conscri- yeah, conscript yeah, yeah, yeah. airsofters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Minister for airsoft, right? <laughs> Get her in. And we are like, we need to decide who best, who is best, what, what parts of society are best to, to arm, least risk arm, and defend the nation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say... Serving military here who are biffed up, but can still there's, they're like they're like walking wounded. Okay. They can still hold a weapon, right? Ex ex military, anyone, anyone ex military, right? And there's a third, there's a third <laughs> group. The third in, arm. <laughs> there's a third group in. There is a third group in that maybe you could argue. Uh, I've got more experience than other parts of the civilian. Uh, civilian parts of uh, of the population that you could maybe arm. You know who I'm thinking. There's also a fourth, mate. There's a fourth. Am I right, though? Xbox players. Xbox. <laughs> Call of Duty, mate. To be honest, <laughs> fucking those guys. Those guys clear up on the battlefield. I I used to I used to play. I used to say I used to play. I used to play Xbox with my eldest, and and some of those kids. Yeah. They're all over it. I mean, I lasted about three, not even three minutes on, on an Xbox game. I got destroyed by some like 13 year old. <laughs> so, probably the 13 year old probably knows more about how the guns work than the airsoft guys. Back to my point don't avoid the conversation. <laughs> I, th- there is an argument to be made. Well, if we were strapped, would you, would you arm airsofters? Would you, oh, hang on, hang on. Would you see them as less risk to arm? And more likely to survive than general population. Hold on a minute. You've given me two before that. You gave me biff chits and you gave me veterans. Yeah. And then you gave me air softers. Yeah, we're doing the biff chits and veterans. But here's the question then. Would you agree? <laughs> I fucking wouldn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> that air softers, not happening, mate. Air softers are, are less, if you were to put a weapon in their hands, they are less risk of being a drama with that weapon, more likely to understand how to use that weapon, and more likely to survive a battle than, a, than other civilians are. No, mate. What I would do... Why would you mean? Would you do, know the answer, yes. Put, I, put the fucking, I put the softers in the stores, because the, they know the good gear, they're good at kit, 
They know the good guns. G4. And they can issue, yes. And they can issue the gear to the I'm fucking airsoft is now. No, I'm sorry, mate. So they can... Although, unless we've got... E- e- unless we've got ex-vets and serving military that do airsoft, we'll have those guys. There's better people for Stormen. Like, which parts of the society guys. would you have as a Stormen? Who would be good as a Stormen? Issuing kit. Airsofters. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking airsofters. <laughs> Mate, I've got right, I've got nothing nothing against airsofters, fucking hell, but some of those legends that are out there, Jesus. It's um it's interesting, it really is. What does uh, what does threat reduction limited do? I've literally so, got zero you know, idea. You know, you know what, mate? Um I initially had to start um, when I wrote my autobiography I needed um I needed to a company or or a, a form of to be able to be paid and all that sort of jazz. Um and some of the, the, the speaking engagements and stuff I was doing, and randomly, I'd had no idea about companies and stuff. And one of the guys said, well, you need to go on the company's house and all that sort of jazz. And we were just typing in shite. And threat, randomly, threat reduction came out of it. Um, and as opposed to Kim Hughes Enterprises or fucking KSH or whatever. You know, so that's, that's kind of where it stemmed from. And then it's kind of evolved um, over, over the years. So... Again, it's a, my company, it, it goes from um, advisory. So I do a lot of technical advisory stuff in the um, security and counter um, terrorism space through to firearms instruction, um, through to training with the police, um, both in the UK and, and overseas. Um, and a lot of training delivery, basically. That's essentially it. Do you find having the GC is more of a benefit in business or not? Do you think you, do you think, and, and so, and I don't know why I asked that the blue, right? I just, I do think sometimes, because <clears throat> it depends how someone handles, handles an award like that. Depends whether it can be a hindrance or a help. Right? I've, There's I've, definitely advantages to it. I mean, the course. networking advantage example, the VCGC yeah. Association, yeah. for example, right? But I think that, uh, it's, it always interests me how people handle those kinds of things because some people really, some people get embarrassed by uh, yeah. receiving awards like yeah, that. Of course. And they can close down a little bit, don't use it. Like I know, I know like people who are MBs and OBs, you would never know. They never use the letters after their name mm. and, and uh, <clears throat> never use the letters after their name and, and, and they, for whatever reason. Uh, um, yeah, what do you think? I mean, what's, what's the experience of being awarded a GC like? I mean, I've always said it's the best thing and the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Oh, there we go. Okay, go on. Um, explain that. Because, I mean, when I, when I, was, when I was awarded it, um, I mean, I didn't even know the magnitude of, of what that really meant at the time. Um, it's funny because when I was, just, just going back a bit, when I was um, awarded, or when I was kind of, wasn't really told... Um, it was uh, my adjutant called me into into the office and said you need to be in London next week for some post Afghanistan party and you can take five of your family and all that sort of jazz <clears throat> and this wasn't my investiture this was the announcement uh, sorry the announcement and and being a senior NCO I was like I'm talking about what's the party where's it at timings all this sort of jazz as you do and um, excuse me and he literally I was turning I was tying him in knots so I was like well you, what you not it's not making sense etc etc and in the end he kind of stood up and said all right i'm going to the toilet and spun his computer screen around and walked out and it said there uh kim hughes level one award and even then i was like well, i don't even know what that means um and then uh, literally i think he then spilt to the commanding officer that you know i might have told him that he's getting it so the co then called me back in and said right this is what's happening this is what you're getting and and i didn't really grasp what that meant with regards to the the george cross um, and I say it's the best thing and it's the worst thing that's ever happened to me because I, you get treated very differently. Um, I essentially became... When you're serving. When I was serving. I became, essentially became the guy on the show horse for the court um, and wasn't really given a choice. Um, it, was, it was during that period of time in Afghanistan where we were getting smashed. Um, we were getting injured. What you know. year was it? Um, owed, action was 2009, <clears throat> award was 2010, um, and we were getting smashed. Guys were getting fucking injured, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so they kind of, I think they, the government wanted a feel, a kind of feel-good story, um, and I got 
my award was announced the same as my friend who died, um, Olaf Schmidt. So Oz, he got posthumous GC as well. Um, and it, we went into London um, and it was kind of, this is, you know, uh, the head of the army was there and all the sort of giving the speeches and all that. And I kind of then got wheeled out into this massive room and there's just press everywhere. And I wasn't really given a choice. So like get in front of them and just talk. Uh, and that, that was it. And then it was like a year and a half of just maybe two years of just craziness. Um, and I say it's the best thing, the worst thing, because best thing, because it's opened so many doors. Clearly it's opened so many doors. Um, I've been to places I've done stuff I would never have done if I, if I hadn't had the George Cross, but equally it's taken me away from all the other stuff, you know, just wanting to, I'm a soldier and I want to be a soldier and I want to just go and do my job. But as much as you think that's going to happen and want that to happen, it, it's never going to be the same after that, you know? Um, so, so yeah, it's just, you get not necessarily dicked around, but dicked around, you know, um, you know, on my last, just before I left the army, um, I had a phone call from the MOD saying, can you be at this event? Um, and I was like, no, I was a, I was a W1 at the time. It's like, no, I've got stuff on, I'm, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. And they, they were like, okay, cool. Um, can you get your commanding officer or the commander to give the general a call to let him know why you can't attend? And I'm like, well, I'm fucking not going to do that, am I? I'm, my CO is never going to do that. So, yeah, brilliant. Where do I need to be? Dick. Um, and, th and that's the sort of stuff you would get. Um, it's not wasn't always like that but you know you, you kind of got a life you got a day job but you're being bounced from all over the place and I, i'm not being ungrateful i'm not being you know whatever and it was as i said it was great but i, I thoroughly go down the line of best and worst thing um but going back to your your initial question yeah i mean it's it's opened so many doors whether whether through business um you know, I, I go to various events. I get invited to various events. I do a lot of after dinner um, speaking, um, a lot of charity stuff, and things then spill out of that, which is which is great. You know, my book, um, my autobiography, that then spilled into fiction writing, uh, which then moved into TV. So, so yeah, clearly it's going to open doors. I mean, I wouldn't have written my autobiography if it wasn't for the fact I had a George Cross, um, and then the fiction that fall out of that as well. I wouldn't have done. Why that. Why you say that? Why? Because. I was, a, I, you know, I wouldn't have been approached for it. I'd have just been a soldier doing my job, you know, and it was only really... Oh, someone came to you asking you. Yeah, oh, okay, so, right. so, <clears throat> yeah, so the, the story behind that was it was my third deployment to Afghanistan. So my first one was um, in 2009. That's when I got the, the recognised for, for the job I did. And then I deployed a further twice, and it was I was out there for the third time on Herrick... I think it was at 19, I think it was. Holy shit. Yeah. Um, 2016, something like that? No, 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 2013, something like that? 13, 14, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and I was out there with my brother. So my bro was a, an EOD operator as well. But this time round, he was going out on the ground and doing the bombs, and I was the guy sending him, which is a bit interesting, a bit messed up. Um, and randomly, I bumped into a mate of mine who was the defense editor for The Sun. He was in Afghanistan at the same time doing whatever. Who was that? Um, who is that, I can't remember your mate's name. Oh, fuck Come on. Hell. No. He's um, a good mate, isn't he? Trying to, trying to <laughs> you put me on the spot. <laughs> fucking hell. Dave Willits. Okay, fuck me. Yeah, yeah. Dave oh, Willits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking hell. Um, he's now moved. He's not there anymore. I was just thinking of the, the current one. Um, so Dave Willits was out there um, and bumped into him in the cookhouse. And he's like, fucking, what are you doing out here? And said, I'm out here. Fucking, he'd interviewed me previously. So I'm out here with my bro. My bro does bombs. He's like, fucking hell, can we do the interview? And I went, I actually said to him, yeah, if you get us tickets to the fucking Millies, we'll do it. And, and he did. Fair Tickets to the what? Millie, oh, some, the Millie. Some military yeah, the awards, Millie, yeah. yeah. Um, so he did. Anyway, so <laughs> the fallout from that is a couple of days later, we did this, we were kind of in the, the EOD task force and loads of media turned up, TV and, and whatnot, and it, and it went kind of public in the UK. The brothers out there, Afghanistan, George Cross, all this sort of jazz. And then from that, I then got approached. I got a couple of emails saying, when are you back in the UK? We'd really like to meet with you um, to talk about writing your book. And I was like... And years before, um, when I got my award, I got asked then. I was like, no, I'm fucking, I'm not going to write a book. I'm whatever. But then I thought, you know what, fuck it, let's have a go. Um, and we did. Um, and Painting the Sound was born from that. And yeah, and then the fallout from that was, was the fiction. Yeah. Why did you go into fiction? I kind of got, I kind of got ambushed into it, I think. Um, Airsofter. Fucking Airsofter. 
Airsoft and Yeah. No, I went, I think, oh God, I can't remember. I think I went for a meeting with my, my publisher, Simon and & Schuster, and my, my agent was there, and I was kind of like, what's going on? And they come, we want you to write fiction. And I was like... Why? Why did they say... I think, I think because... I think because Paint and Sand did so well, um, I, and there was a gap in the market. Oh, sorry, Painting Sand. Painting the Sand. That's your uh, autobiography. autobiography yeah. Okay. And then Painting there was the the, then there was a gap in the market for like adult action adventure kind of fiction. So we got into this meeting and this chat about it, and the fallout from that was, yeah, we'll have a we'll have a pop. So we did. And um, how many have you done now? Four, three, four, three with four, three. Are you doing it under your name or pen name? No money. Yeah. You want to money? Yeah. There's quite a few ex-military that I've come to know over the over the last few years into fiction and just really fucking good at it, like military fiction for yeah. obvious reasons. I don't know why. I, I don't know. It's so di- it's a different form of writing, really. Yeah, from it's weird, from isn't it? from doing from writing an autobiography into fiction, it's just it's so different, yeah. so crazy to get into. And I did struggle. I struggled a bit. I'm um, just trying to get my head around it. You know, because the detail is not as much... In, in an autobiography, you're talking about, you know, if we were talking about this room, we'd talk about the lighting, the smell, the temperature, you know, all that sort of jazz. But then if, you, if you're if you talking about fiction, no one's interested in the room. They want the character to run through the room, get out the other side and do what they need to do. And it was just trying to get my head around that process. Um, but, yeah, it's it's good. It's really interesting, actually. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's good. It's good to... Uh, it's good to be involved in. How did you? So did you have to do? Any, how, how much teaching did you do for yourself for the, for going into fiction? You know, I had a, had a lot of help. I had a, a friend of mine, Sean, who is a is a writer, and he he got me on the straight and narrow. Um, and then another friend of mine, Rob. Um, a, again, it's it's being able to accept constructive criticism yeah. um, because so when I when when we was first doing the um, the autobiography is getting that voice on the page. That's that's what that's what the struggle is. Because I, when I when I first did the first two or three chapters, I would give it to friends and they go, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's Kim. That's you know, I can I can see that in the character." But then if you give that to a, a civilian who doesn't understand acronyms, who doesn't understand military talk, they're like, "I've no idea what you just said there." And so it's trying to find that that kind of equilibrium, that that middle ground. Um, where people can relate to, so it's, it's getting that voice on the page, and I struggled with that. Have you tried? Have you thought about connecting with other military writers? Um, there was actually there was I can't remember the chap's name, um, but I got I got asked to have a meeting. I can't remember his name for the life of me. It was pre-COVID to have a meeting with him to talk about doing a a second to do a sanging book actually, uh, a book on just purely sanging, um, or to at least to at least discuss it. But I kind of uh, COVID happened. Um, so it's probably one to one to follow up on at some stage. You've got like there's loads of them. You got um, Geraint Jones, mm. Gez Jones. You've got Joe Mitchum. So Gez has been on the podcast. You got Joe Mitchum, Joseph Mitchum. is a relatively mm. new writer. He's ex. He's serving. He's serving Still one serving, power. Yeah. He's serving one power. He was on recently. You got uh, James E. Mack. Okay. Who's uh, Erifer connected? Um, all all military fiction and shit. Someone else, shit. <laughs> I can't remember. But a sangin book would be good. Sangin book. I thought about. I thought about doing years ago because I've. I'm gonna invert the commas. I wrote a book. Right. It's a, it's it's a it's a close protection tam tactically. Yeah. It's the uh, it's the world's best selling CB tam even now. Uh, very niche area. It doesn't make me millions, but it, you know it it sells <coughs> sells itself as well. Which is good. Awesome. But. That's, again, that is so far removed from an autobiography or a fiction book. It's just like completely fucking different. You know, it's lists and processes and yeah, guides and, well, and walk through talk through time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Walk through talk through. Um, but I thought about, I did at one point think about doing a fiction book. And it, but it was, because I didn't, I just like the idea of writing. I, I like the idea of putting my experiences to paper, but in a, not in a, oh, look at me way. Because I'm just fucking another soldier, right? Uh, but also... I like the idea of. Have you ever heard of a book called The Thirteenth Valley? No. I'm going to be careful. I don't want to give away this this book this book plot, right? As in mine. I'm not. I'm never going to do it. I'd like someone else to do it though. One hundred percent. The Thirteenth Valley is pro- is the greatest war book I have ever read ever. Mate, you need to, you make, you need, need you to get this book. You need to repaint the sign, mate. It's pretty you cool. Need to get, <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, this is fiction. Paint the sand is fact. Well, the thirteenth valley. Thirteenth valley's fiction. Yeah. It's by a guy called John Del Vecchio. Okay. Right. John Del Vecchio was a combat correspondent in the Vietnam War. He deployed like six times out of Vietnam, attached to a bunch of different units. He's written a few books, two or three books. The, the only one I've read, he's written a couple of things, the only one I've read is The 13th Valley. My, my dad banged on about 30th, 13th Valley since I was a kid. On and on about it. I didn't buy it until, because you couldn't get it in the UK. Is it on audiobook? I, I'm not sure. So you couldn't get it in the UK. It was only when things like Amazon came about. And I able to order it online. It took weeks to deliver because okay. only in the US. I think you can get it over here now. Anyway, what he's done in, in the 13th Valley is he has brought together all of his real-world first-hand experiences of when he was on the ground on those six tours with the troops. So all little, so all the little anecdotal stories in mm. the book, like contacts, finding intelligence, conversations that went on the cookhouse, conversations that went out on the ground in the patrol harbour, all of those things that have injuries, deaths, all of the stuff. He's brought all of the fictional... Uh, the, the fact-based anecdotes together. Mm -hmm. He's weaved them all together from all his six tours together into a, 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 a plot which is fictional and it all happened on the one tour for one unit. Awesome. And hey, the fucking book is brilliant. And it's brilliant because all of the little stuff is real. It happened. These yeah. are conversations that <laughs> happened. And you learn such an amazing amount about Vietnam and it's so realistic. It's, it just draws you right in. It's a big, it's not a small book, it's a big book. And the plot is, he's attached to a, a, a battalion of the 101st Airborne called the 50 Juice and they get intelligence. They receive intelligence that is in, in this valley, in a series of valleys, the 13th Valley along called the Ketalo Valley. In this valley, there is an MVA HQ element. Mm -hmm. And they are tasked, the battalion is tasked to go in, find and destroy, confirm that they're there, find and destroy the HQ element. They do the classic, companies in the high ground securing it, and then they have one of the companies going into the jungle floor. It's all jungle, jungle floor, and go through, and they're heading towards the end of, like the end of the valley floor is this big prominent tree, which you can see if you get high enough in the canopy or in a clearance, and they're heading towards there. And the book is about them going in and I'm clearing through the jungle towards this tree. And uh, I won't mention any more. It doesn't, like, it isn't the HQ element that's there. <laughs> Basically, what's there is a fucking battalion, battalion. of MBA. Yeah, yeah. And you've got a company on the ground. Awesome. It is, it is uh, the most amazing book ever, the way it builds the characters. But when I thought about Sangin or Afghan, yeah. I think the best way to bring in the realism and people's stories of what happened into a... In, into some, it's a way to tell true stories, right, mm -hmm. that happened, which you couldn't tell a true story if it was in a real book. Yeah. Right? Because there's stuff, there's stuff in your autobiography, I'm guessing, that you couldn't put in. Sure. Right? Because, like, there's some, st like, there's some things I think about, and I have writing this book, and I think, this, I could not put that in a fact-based book. Because, holy fuck, that actually happened. That person's got a family. That person doesn't you anymore, for example. And, and the circumstances are so horrific. You just wouldn't be able to do it. You could change all the names you wanted, but it's like, but, but you could do it in a fiction book. No, you see, you say that, mate. You can. I mean, MOD processes aside, so when I wrote Paint in the Sand, I had to jump through, I was still serving, I had to jump through so many hoops oh, to, right. to get it out there yeah, yeah, um, yeah. through the MOD. And and because I was talking about fallen soldiers, the family, I mean, the, the family got to see it. They got to comment on it um, and then go from there. And there was a lot of change. And so it goes through various sections of the MOD, you know, for factual correctness um, through operational um, OPSEC and all mm -hmm. that sort of good stuff and PERSEC and, and all those sort of all those sort of good things. And then the, the family stuff. But you, you, I, I think stories like that need to be told. Um, be, uh, don't get me wrong. Some stuff out there shouldn't be, you know, it, what happens on the ground stays on the ground. But... You know, this. I, th I think people would want to s not only want to read about it, but unless they, if it's in fiction, you know, fiction's fiction. I write fiction, and you know, you can tell a story which people go, "Fucking never happened in a million years." Well, it's fucking fiction, of course not. Or maybe it would. But the real stories. I mean, I thought about doing. Oh, the other writer was James Deegan. There's oh, okay, yeah. Sorry, 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 James. <laughs> so, so I, I thought about writing stuff. You know, stories from the front line or what, whatever. Um, but some of those stories need to be told, mate. But th there's reasons why we yeah, won't Yeah, but sometimes tell there's better ways to do it. So if you imagine, like, 
one I had, I'm not, I'm, again, I'm, this isn't me pitching a book that I haven't written yet. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it, right? Because I haven't got the fucking time. I don't want to put this pressure on myself. But I think that in those experiences I had across, the, like I went to Afghan three times as well, right? In those experiences, and some of the stories actually from Iraq, <coughs> if I wrote an autobiography with the intent of just communicating this stuff, it wouldn't have the same impact on someone in terms of, Hmm. Yeah, entertainment, enjoyment, I think, as if if they were all brought together into a shorter thing, into a like a fictional main plot. If the reader knew that those anecdotes, holy shit, the guy who wrote this, these are all real things. Because that's one thing that John Del Vecchio puts at the start, at the start of his book before he write, before he actually gets into the fiction. He says many of the things in this book are real. I experienced, mm. and and when you read the book, you go, holy fuck! Mm. It makes a big difference in the way you read it because it's you know it's bullshit. But parts of it are not. Something real, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it kind of leaves you. You know what I mean? And then also, if you're doing fiction, it gives you a bit of artistic license. It does. <laughs> oh, God, does it ever. Does it ever. I mean, yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some of, it, some, of it's, some of it's cringeworthy, how much artistic license you do get. And so, and, but you've got to, I've always found, you've got to remember, you're not writing for your mates to read it. Mm. That's a big thing, a big, big thing, because there's so many times where I've done stuff and I've written stuff in there and, and we've spoken about it and we've gone backwards and forwards on it going, no, let's, we're not going to say that grenade takes down a building or whatever. I mean, we spoke about that earlier. Um, but artistic, you've got it. You're not, you're not writing it for your, your, your ex-regiment guys. You're writing it for the wider masses. So, But you know what? I think people want to hear it. I've had so many, so many people... Um, come and talk to me after I've done speaking engagements or talks or after reading my book or doing, you know, the book tours and stuff like that, that, that have said, you know, thanks for, thanks for telling the story, how it is on the ground. And that was the one thing I wanted mm. to do when, when writing, painting the sand, it's not bombs and bullets and cutting wire with your teeth and fucking baying it in your mouth and running to it. It's not that. It's the just sometimes, just, just sometimes, sometimes, just the, the odd once or twice, just for the air softers. <laughs> um, it's um, it's realism. It's what it's like to be under fire. It's what it's like to put fucking dead soldiers into fucking bin bags, um, and you know, doing bombs. And, and I wanted to have people. I wanted to immerse people into the book. This is what it's. Kajaki does the same fucking thing, mate. You know, it, it puts people on the ground. And I've spoken to a couple of people about Kajaki and they go, oh, yeah. I said, fuck you. That's what it's like. And if, you, if you're not there, that's what it's like. And, oh, it's, it's Hollywood. It's fucking not Hollywood. And so by telling Who those stories. That? Oh, some fucking, Ex-military. Some fucking airs off that. Airs off that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, there was, was kickback from, from some, some senior staff yeah, about that. Yeah. Because they were saying... Well, why aren't they, why haven't they got their shirts on? Why are they in shorts and flip flops? Because that's what that's where it was. That's, that's what it was. Yeah, that's <laughs> yes. what it was. It's like Seriously, it's like, if 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 no one's seen Kajaki, fuck me, go and watch it. Well, it's Kilo Two Bravo on Netflix now. Oh, is it? The, yeah, they, the the name is they they they, they, they Americanized the name when it went to America and they, they kept it. So it's Kilo Two Bravo. Oh, you, if you search Kajaki, it'll come up. Yeah, Kilo you, Two I Bravo. Think, I think I watched yeah. it recently. It's anyway, enough about Kajaki. So we were talking about yeah. we were talking about you, Kim. <sighs> Let's talk about Jack. It's awesome, um, but yeah. So I, th- I think there is there is certainly a place for the story. Now, if you intertwine that into a fiction um, novel, then then fine. And I, I'm really looking forward to reading that. Hopefully, it's um, audible because shit at reading. Um, Why are you shit at reading? Uh, it's just, it's just I, not. I'm just shit at reading. I'm, you, I'm just, just be a bit more explanatory. As in, as in, so I always, I always struggled when I was a kid at reading and writing. I mean, I can read and oh, write now. Oh, you mean like, okay. Yeah, I, I, right, but okay. I can read and write now, but shit, shit being um, just concentrating on something. For, that's because it's practice. So I was, I, my, my, my head went down the pan, just mental health stuff went down the fucking pan. I couldn't, re- I couldn't read more than a couple of sentences. And I used to be a prolific reader, right? I couldn't read more than a couple of sentences and I'd be rereading, rereading, because I just forget, 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 re 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 yeah. read. I wouldn't get past the paragraph. So I can't, I can't read fiction because I, I've got to go back over it and I'll, I'll read it and go, and I just don't get it. I read it in, whether I'm reading it in like a monotone thing in my head going, uh, and I don't get it. So that's why I love audio book. Because you can, you can, you can, yeah. um, you know. Funnily enough, I so my both my novels are in audio book, and I've had so many people. Is that it's audio on, book? It's on all. It's yes, all the way. Thirteenth Valley. I'm gonna order that in a minute. I've had yeah. It's so only m- twenty seven hours of reading. Listen, okay, that's twenty seven hours. I told you the book was. Mate, it's brilliant, mate. No, I'm down. I'll, I'll listen to that. Anyway, sorry. Um, 
Yeah, I've had so many people come to me and say about the audio, you know, the novels in audio, because so much better than the actual reading of it. I mean, everyone likes to pick up a book and read. I'm not a massive fan. Um, but audiobook is so much better because the, the voices are there and everyone, every character's got their own kind of traits and all that sort of jazz. So for me, it's, it's, it's a lot better. I prefer mm. it. I, I, I do both. And, but one of the main reasons I try and read is to exercise my mind in focusing. Okay. Yeah, I, I just, it's, I, I, it's a muscle, got to keep it. Yeah. And I, was, I was so poor with it for various, various reasons. And now I just try and keep on top of it. No, that's cool. Yeah, I audible when I'm in the car. Yeah. Uh, audible and podcast. Yeah, I mean, I, tra I travel so much, so audible was just, audible was amazing for me. Mm. See, Absolutely I, I, amazing. Yeah, I travel a couple of times a week, but I'd love to, like, it's one of the things that, I'd love to be, uh, probably the only reason I'd love to do something where I was traveling a lot, like a truck or something. Can you imagine how much knowledge you could soak up if you were a lorry driver or, or someone who literally had to drive all day every day? No, mate. I'd be a walk encyclopedia. No, mate. I used to be a driver in the Royal Logistic Courts. Oh, what do you mean? No. Yeah, but in the, RL <laughs> yeah, but in, in the RLC, <laughs> just drive big green yeah, trucks, but you mate. can't cut about with fucking well, an audio book on in the RLC. Can probably, you? probably can now. I mean, fuck me. That was dull. Don't knock drivers. Uh, you know, do it. It's not for me. Stop me. And I drive a lot. Did you say don't knock the RLC? Is that no, the... drivers. RLC? No, RLC is mega. We'll just go. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> you know, yeah. supporting. Like yeah. it. What have we not covered that we want you to cover? Uh, For fuck's sake. Um, We're uh, hour and 20 in, you. Yeah? Are we? Yeah. What are we supposed to be? We're not. Well, I need the toilet and we're going to go get breakfast and we've got to go to. Um, I've got to get you to. Uh, under orders to get you to the Aardvark group. Yes. For photos. Photos. Out. And the Davis Photo. John Clare's orders. Photos by my photo. Yeah. Has he got a coin for me? He's not going to be there, is he? Uh, I want one of his coins. Is no, he... but then, uh, no, he's going to send you one. Yeah, I'll, I like that. Well, he's got oh, patches. Got a patch as well. He's got I'm patches. Not, I'm yeah, not a patch guy, mate. I'm, not pa I'm going to send you all my patches because I'm not a patch guy. Um, yeah, that's I'm a, I'm a that's a nice gesture. You Are you going to send me the shit you don't want? <laughs> Very nice gesture. Mate, I appreciate it, mate. It's yeah. good. It's good. It's going to be a lot of shit. You send me your books as well. I'll throw them in the bin. Door, <laughs> door stop, mate. Door stop. Audible. <laughs> All available on Audible. Um, yeah. No, we've got maybe a coin there. If not, you'll send me on money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you need to come back up anyway. We'll catch you, we'll catch you in for lunch. No, no definitely. Um, what have we not covered here? Um, uh, we did America. We did guns. We did airsofters. We did uh, coins. Um, oh, Threat Reduction Limited. Done that. So what do you want to pitch? How do people get your books? Uh, you, online. You can order Audible for... Yeah, Audible. You can get more on Audible. You can get them on... Um, and just search for Kim Hughes. Yeah, Kim Hughes. Painting the Sand is the... Um, Why is it Audible called Painting thing? the Sand? Because, pal, um, when EOD operators in Afghanistan uncovered IEDs, did it with a paintbrush. So you paint the sand away from the ID. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, quite like it. Works. Yeah. Yeah, so there's that. And then my fiction, Operation Certain Death, Operation Black Key are the two fictions. Black Key? Black Key, yeah. yeah. And then... you got two more coming, have you? Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Um, you know, we'll see how that goes. We're in, the, we're in the writing stages, which is interesting at the moment. But yeah. yeah. yeah it's good, mate. It's good. And then the, so when someone buys, buys one of your totems, did you say money goes to charity or not? So we, I used to, I used, a percentage of it would, would go to a charity, but there's only... That's a know, no then. Well, not anymore, not anymore. <laughs> so what we do now is um, if you want to donate a Wayfinder totem, you can tick that box All and right, then, then we will send that to... So when you do that, right? Do, so what gets sent to the person? That, what you've got there. So the totem gets sent uh -huh. and the card. Yeah. All right, because... These are fucking cool gifts, mate. I like them. And there's people in the back of my mind who think that this would be great to send them as a, as a good gesture. So, um, uh, so uh, where's that little bit I read in the card? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah. So for those who have seen the film Inception, a totem is used to allow the holder to know they are in the real world. I love that concept. Hence the coin's name. And therefore, reminding you to keep shit real when you have it with you. I like that. I like that. I do that constantly trying to say, especially stuff... That makes me stressed out or emotionally like, uh, yeah, my emotions are raised for whatever reason. And I think you need, there's no need to be, you don't need to be stressing over this. And like something like this, well, I've got it now. Be like, keep shit real. Just fucking chill out. What does it really, what does it, that thing that's just happened that is stressing you out, what does it really mean? 
Exactly. How does it really impact you? Is it in your brain or is it external? Because if it's in your brain, you can influence it. If it's external, it's not. It's probably in, in internal. You know what I mean? You can control that. Yeah. It's just hard sometimes. I no, like it, mate. I like it. Good, yeah, it does. It, it, you know what, mate? It, it, it hit home for so many. And it means something different to everyone that has it. You know, um, I quite like it. And I'm doing a lot. I'm doing a lot of stuff at the moment with guys, guys and girls that suffer with PTSD. And I've started. We've come up with a, a new, a new version of it. Um, I, I sat down with them a couple of weeks ago, and basically just asking what, how, how their thought process is manifests, what, what they do to get there. You know, from fall, stopping themselves from falling down that rabbit hole. Um, and it was um, have something in their hands, distract them, all that sort of stuff. And we come up with. Um, with those actually um so the brass the brass peeves on the end is the wayfinder totem as you can see there oh yeah it's, it's the like same a, so i've got my hand for people listening it's like and it looks like a first glance a rosary bead rosary yeah beads. so so initially we did the sort of mala beads and then um something to mess around with the guys in the hand and it's not religious um in the slightest it's just something to occupy the mind mess around with it and so that's um so the bead there is essentially on the end the brass bead is the uh, wayfinder totem the Rock is from the most recent volcanic eruption in Iceland. From so Lassa each of the Costa. beats. Yeah. Okay. So that was made made by that. And then the 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 rope or the Dyneema is from uh, a command pull ID that I um, rendered no safe way. in Sangin. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. So um yeah so I'm banging those out for um for a lot of the guys and girls at the moment and it's just something just to dick around in their hands with just to you know just to take their mind off of the um the shit that messes with them. You know, so yeah, did that for that for a couple of the guys and girls. But the coins have just gone absolutely crazy, mate. Um, people are loving them, and I, I love gifting them to people, sending them out to people. You know, I've had so many people reach out to me, certainly on Instagram, um, saying that they're struggling and all that sort of stuff. And and I like to spend time with certainly veterans um, that that struggle with it, and I love to gift them the coins because it works for me. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I, I can't say I suffer with mental health or PTSD. Um, but I, I've got friends and family that have, so it's quite close to home. Um, and certainly in, in the, the EOD, the bomb disposal community, we're such a small community. Um, so it kind of hits home when one of our brothers or sisters struggle. And it's not just those, it's the armed forces. But equally, it's, you know, a lot of these go out to civilians that struggle. You know, everything's relative. Um, and people struggle with different things. So, um, so yeah, they hit home, really, really hit home. And it means it means something different to everyone that has them so so yeah but a massive again a massive thanks to tom for for making it happen so what's the website um so on shopify threat reduction limited um Shop sorry on shopify so shopify yeah shopify and threat reduction. yeah or um my instagram page the links in my bio oh, cool. and you can you can find it i'll there. put a link in the blurb to the podcast for yeah it's cool man but uh but yeah no it's cool awesome hey it's been a pleasure cheers pal yeah it's been awesome so we fixed America, fucking right, mate. Fixed America. We fixed home defence through the employment of airsofters. airsofters. Yeah, I right? think your I think idea. That's key. Your idea. I'm happy with that. You I'll are that. minister of airsoft. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a coin made and a patch, yes, a yes, coin and a patch. Yeah. In fact, Tom, in fact, Tom has had, Tom has had so many shouts out on this podcast. I think Tom should do us a ministry of airsoft coin. Ministry of airsoft. Well, yeah. I would buy that coin. I would gift it to you, mate. I would sell them. <laughs> yeah, you make a minute. Ministry of Airsoft. We should come together on it. Yeah. Ministry of, Air, Ministry of Airsoft. Well, they're like, it sounds like something like Harry Potter, and they're, they're tactical wizards, aren't they? Mate, we Wizardry. Have, we just have some cool, like, badge. Right. We don't need reserves. We need to bolster the Airsoft, th you know airsoft what? industry. I d <laughs> need to pump it up. I think we should do it. Yeah. I'm down. Pump it up. <laughs> Mate, it's been a pleasure. Cheers, Paul. We're done. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H-Hour. Becoming a patron of H-Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I 
do with each guest that last about five, ten minutes that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H Hour have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast starts getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about ten minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N, patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.